star out of me. We'll make a film about a man who's sad and lonely. And all I gotta do is act naturally. Well, I'll bet you I'm gonna be a big star. Might win an Oscar, you can never tell. The movie's gonna make me a big star. Hi, welcome to Meet Me in the Movies. Noel T. Manning II here. We appreciate everybody who spends time with us on this show, however you choose to do that. Uh, if you're uh, checking in through C19 TV, we appreciate that. If you decide to listen to the podcast version through WGWG.org, thank you. And if you're deciding to check out the video stream, that's through C19.tv. So however you choose to do it, we want to thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, we do talk movies right here on uh, Meet Me in the Movies. Uh, that's what's in the name. It's in the title. You know, we wouldn't be talking about like, I don't know, um, floor molding uh, unless it had something to do with movies. So we, we may look at set design and talk to a floor molding expert sometime on the show. But Kevin Sampson, our guest, is not a floor molding expert. But <laughs> I'm not. <nice. laughs> <laughs> but he is. Uh, he's got some pretty cool credentials uh, to his name. Uh, he uh, is the host. For Picture Lock, he is the founder of the DC Black Film Fest. He's a film publicist, a filmmaker publicist, also a film professor. So you've got all of those things to your name, and Thomas is just a, a, a co-host. So, man. <laughs> Basically, yeah, yeah. It's all right. <laughs> Thomas Manning, thank you for joining us as well. And uh, and, and Kevin, I mean, you know, we were talking right before uh, we went on the air about um, – if anything out of the um, the pandemic, we've been able to reach out and um, and speak to to film critics and to filmmakers and, and to others that we normally would not connect with because it's not really within driving distance or our flexible schedules. But this makes it so much more fun uh, to be able to connect with others. So I'm really glad that you were able to spend some time with us today. Yeah, I, I, thanks for having me on. Uh, as as we were saying, you know. I haven't been able to talk shop, you know, I'm not able to go into the theater and then just like talk with you guys afterwards after a screening. So this is awesome. So excited to geek out and just be on the show. And you are based in Charlotte, but you are all over the place. You teach uh, through a Virginia university and then you've got the, uh, the DC film festival uh, as well. So uh, tell me, let's back up and, and talk about your love of film and how that got started and, and how it's grown over the years. Yeah, so, uh, you know, growing up, it's interesting because, you know, my brother and I have a brother, Michael, shout out to Mike. Uh, you know, when we were growing up, we'd play video games like most kids and things like that. But most of the time, like my brother would be into the video games and I would be just watching movies. And there's something about uh, movies, I just enjoyed the storytelling of it, getting lost in it. And so um, I actually got into acting and, and drama and things like that. So uh, in high school, I was a thespian. Uh, <laughs> Me too. Me yeah, too. I see? <laughs> and what I enjoyed about that is like in, in, in our life, you know, you can only be Kevin Sampson, right? But when you are an actor, you can be anyone. You can be a fireman. You can be a police officer. You can, um, you know, be the president or whatever the case may be. And so when I went to uh, college at University of South Carolina, I studied media arts and I realized, man, when I get behind the camera, I can tell so much more of the story and control so much more of the story. So uh, that's kind of where I went for college. And then I did a couple of years after I, I made a couple of documentaries, uh, realized that they sucked. They were good. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, girlfriend at the time, uh, wife now, she was like, well, maybe you should go out to grad school. So um, she was actually in D.C. at Georgetown and uh, went up there. I went to American University, got my uh, MFA in film and electronic media. And so that's kind of how I have the ties to the D.C. area. Um, from there, you know, to, to make a long story long, uh, <laughs> I, I was running the Rosebud Film Festival up there at the um, uh, public access station that I, I worked at. I'd always wanted to have my own film festival and uh, the DC Black Film Festival I found as a way to be able to tell stories that were by or about people of African descent yeah. that were really in a positive light. And I think that's one of the things that we really need these yeah. days. Uh, and so, so that kind of started, but you know, as you guys know, like being a film critic, you, you, 
and the festival director, all this kind of stuff, you, you start wearing so many different hats that right. it's just like, that's how the publicist title comes on and right. you know, a festival director, critic, all this kind of right. stuff. So here we are. Um, yeah, so I teach uh, film appreciation uh, in the cinema studies uh, at Northern Virginia Community College. So it's really exciting. Well, yeah, that's one of the things I think when you're able to uh, explore all of these different avenues of film and love of film, it does expand what you want to be involved in. Um, I'm, I'm, I've been involved in a film festival. I'm the founder, one of the, the founders of the Real to Real Film Festival in 21 years now uh, this summer. And uh, Thomas is getting a chance to serve on a uh, film screening committee, basically, basically the selection committee. And so the more of those things you're able to get your feet into, um, the more opportunities it will provide for, for you, but also it, you really do get a sense for the things you do love and the things that you choose not to. And you know, you talking about uh, doing things behind the camera and how that really opened up your mind to, hey, maybe I don't really particularly need to be an actor. Uh, maybe I can do other things, tell other stories. Same way with me. Um, mm. In high school, I really thought film, uh, well, I thought that acting was where I wanted to go, and I thought going acting into film was where I was headed, and um, had a chance to um, go to the governor's school uh, for, for acting, did not do it for, for other for reasons, but um, college did some acting, and but once I got my chance to do some uh, behind the scenes stuff and create my own work, I said, whoa, 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 you know, you really do get a chance to touch every aspect of it. So I'm, I'm right there with you and feel that. And uh, Thomas, I think you've got a question as a college student, yeah, Thomas, yeah. do you have any, you have something you want to chime in for, uh, for Kevin? Yeah, well, I'm sure with the uh, transition from filmmaking to film criticism and then you know, actual film uh, as a film professor, I'm sure that's given you a really interesting perspective on how to communicate to your students or communicate within your reviews, just uh, some of the incredible like worksmanship that goes into filmmaking. So like, how, how has that connection, uh, how has that benefited you? Yeah, you know, it's like almost like that scene in the Matrix when uh, Neo just starts seeing the numbers and the bullets fall. And <laughs> it's, it's kind of like that. Uh, I think because, you know, I just had a passion for it as a kid, uh, just watching so many movies. But then when you actually go to school, you study it, right? Then that just really gives you kind of uh, understanding of the basics. I always kind of say this, right? Um, to play basketball, anybody can do it. But when you actually study the fundamentals, well, then you can actually break the rules. And so, um, yeah, it's just really helped me to, one, understand, um, you know, what it takes to make a film, having done it myself. And so I think that even spills into, as a festival director, like I love my filmmakers because I know without the filmmakers, we don't have a film festival, but I also respect the craft and what it takes to make a short film, whether, you know, it gets selected or not. Um, but then, you know, again, teaching the history of it, I'm learning uh, as we go through the semester, you know, different movements, parallel film movement and Japanese cinema. And, you know, it, it's, it's really exciting. So it's one of those things where, um, especially, you know, dealing with students, they keep you on your toes and you can't just kind of slack off or rest on your laurels. So <laughs> that part I really enjoy. <laughs> well, you know, you also, uh, I, going back to the, uh, the film festival aspect of things, there are a select few films that actually end up making it to the screening opportunities for people. And, you know, you have to, you know, Thomas is, is realizing this, that, you know, not every film that you look at is going to be, uh, you know, an award caliber film or even a screen worthy, screening worthy film. Uh, you have to sift through some that maybe are not the, the best, but, right. but even with that, uh, you know, I've always said that, that nobody sets out to make a bad film. And even in the, the worst of films, uh, there's a lot of work that goes on to make that happen. And you, you, there are times that we see mainstream films, blockbuster films that are really bad, you know, <laughs> for various reasons. And, <laughs> and they pour a whole lot money in, more money into it than, than a, a film festival film would. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it, it's, uh, you know, as a film critic, you know, you, you want to look for 
the things that are good, but you also want to, to point out the things that maybe could have done better. And I think, uh, you know, you and I, um, and, and, and Thomas, as he's growing into this, uh, you know, we do try to look at every aspect from sound design to production design to the acting, which, you know, I, I, for me, one of the first turnoffs of if I see bad acting from the start, I, I have a hard time, unless it's supposed <laughs> to be bad acting. Right. <laughs> so, so what are some of the um, things that will draw you into a film? What are the films that you really feel or the films that you must see? Yeah, you know, um, kind of just to go back for a second on, on, on what Thomas, you know, just looking at bad films, right? Um, I think like you're saying, uh, that we can learn from bad films and especially like as a filmmaker, like you can learn, um, but just watching films that come into the festival, a lot of times, what, and, and what I love about film criticism is that you have to actually articulate why it is bad. And sometimes those are the hardest reviews to write, right? Um, but it forces you to get in, in touch with that, right? So uh, it was slow. It just sucked, right? That doesn't really work. But <laughs> the pacing was not at the appropriate rate for the spitfire. You know what I mean? Yes. Like, and so when you actually dig deep into that, then suddenly you're able to really, one, appreciate the great films, um, and two... You can, I, I think for me personally, as a, as a filmmaker and wanting to uh, get better at the craft, like you, you can understand, okay, let me think through these aspects. So it's definitely uh, <laughs> a, a learning moment, even though like sifting through like with film festivals, some of those bad ones. Um, and, uh, but, but for me personally, I, I find myself really attracted to drama or suspense thrillers. I think... Yeah. I love a good action film. Uh, you know, I am horrified of horror films, so I don't really touch them. <laughs> but, <Yeah. laughs> but I'll, I'll check out an Ari Aster or, you know, It is coming out or whatever. But, um, but for me, again, going back to as a, as a child, I wanted to get lost in people's stories. And I feel like with drama or, you know, the suspense thriller, you just really kind of hopefully are on the edge of your seats. Or you see something... Um, again, as film being an art, uh, it mirrors life, right? And so mm -hmm. you can see something in the, in the story that you can relate to, that, that universality of it, right. and, uh, and learn a, about yourself at the same time yeah. that you're, you're watching a film. So uh, those are the ones that really I'm, I'm attracted to. Are there certain films that you remember from your childhood or from your teen years that just stand out as those that you go back to for that very reason? Yeah, you know, um, it's interesting because I would say Remember the Titans uh, is one that like <laughs> the song for the opening of the show, you know, they're going to put me in the movies. Yes. <laughs> one that Ryan Gosling was singing in the dormitory. I don't know if you remember that. Like, when <laughs> they're all like uh, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> talking to each other. So I, I thought that was really hilarious. But remember the Titans? So there was like a few. Remember the Titans was one that I think I saw in theaters like three times. I saw The Matrix three times. And, and I have friends that like, my buddy Pierce saw Jurassic Park like in the teen times at, in the theater. His mom was really dedicated. Uh, but those were some of the films that I, de I definitely remember. I was just like, oh, wow, like this, I got to see this again. This was, it's something about it that really captured my attention. Um, but then I remember specifically when I went to college. So I grew up in, you know, my parents, uh, I wouldn't say I was like sheltered, but I, I honestly, I mean, I, I appreciate the way that they raised me, but I hadn't seen that many rated R films. So right. um when I went to college, I saw Scarface for the first time. And I remember distinctly when uh, he goes over to Manolo's house and his sister comes out the back. And the way that he just like was so upset, I literally saw red myself wow. in that moment. I don't know how that happened. I don't yeah. know how that worked because I've, I like literally have gone back in uh, just to watch the film to see if there was red in it. And that didn't happen, but like it just, transfixed me i don't know like i just like suddenly i saw the red like it so so that was definitely one that like and especially i was like whoa you can like cut somebody's arm off with a chainsaw like in a movie <laughs> yeah. <laughs> was, yeah yeah well, well thomas do you have a question before break oh uh, yeah so i was wondering like basically at what age did the media film go from like 
just pure entertainment to something that you thought there could be something a lot deeper, whether it be thematically or something that you could see yourself analyzing and critiquing or even contributing to in the filmmaking business? It's a great question. Thanks. I, was, uh, I gotta like, good thing I'm on the couch. Like I gotta, I gotta think about this. Um, yeah, like I would say that it wasn't until college. I've always been kind of a late bloomer. Like uh, I was on the step team and in undergrad in my fraternity. And like, I was the guy that like needed the extra help afterwards to get it down. <laughs> so, so, and plus I was like younger. So I started kindergarten at four. So I, I don't know, I, I just always a little late. So once I got into college and like I said, I realized, oh, you know what? I could actually get behind the camera. I knew I loved it. I never changed majors. The, the, I wasn't one of those kids that was like, I don't know what I want to do. Um, but it definitely was in college when I realized, okay, this is what I love. Uh, I, I realize that maybe it's difficult to actually make it in this business, but I got I to gotta be around it. I got to give it a shot. Very cool. Very cool. Our guest, Kevin Sampson. I'm Noel T. Manning II. That's Thomas Manning. You are watching Meet Me at the Movies. We're going to take a quick intermission. We're going to come back with Kevin, and we're going to be talking about, what are we going to talk about? Oh, we're going to talk about if a screenplay could be written on your life, who would you have writing said screenplay? So that's going to be our hot topic right here on Meet Me at the Movies, right after this quick intermission on Meet Me at the Movies. They're going to put me in the movies. They're going to make a big star out of me. All the Hi, I'm Shara Miller, the host of Artworks. Each month we bring to you wonderful, talented artists from here in, in Cleveland County and, and the region. We have artists, we have potters, we have painters, we have musicians, we have actors. We just have wonderful artists that come to you and tell you about all that they're doing, their creativity, what inspires them. Join me here on Artworks each month on C19. You can also watch us online at c19.tv. They're gonna put me in the movies. They're gonna make a big star out of me. Welcome back to Meet Me in the Movies. I'm Noel T. Manning II here. We appreciate you spending your time with us right here. Uh, we're back for the second half of Spending Time with Kevin Sampson. Kevin, thanks for being here, man. Uh, Thomas Manning is like the king of questions. Yeah, he's Dude. Cool. This dude's incredible. I mean, he, he's, he's got it, man. You, you, Kev, I, I, I'm, I'm blown away, Thomas. I mean, I expected you to say, so what's your favorite color? You know, because that is a quote from a movie. But, uh, man, good, good job, Thomas. Good job. <laughs> yeah, I'm just doing my best, yeah. <laughs> and Kevin has got his jaw shirt on. He saw Thomas's Scorsese shirt and said, hey, man, I, I, got, I got to do something. And, and Kevin, you Thanks. and I got to spend some time with, uh, with Scorsese as well. Yes. During the Irishman screening. What, wasn't that amazing? That was just so much. I mean, and on top of that, it was Scorsese and uh, Pacino and De Niro all in one room. Like, it's, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and we were, aren't, weren't we both on the front row? We were. And that, that was the thing. I was like, man, I, I truly do believe that, like, in some ways, like, you can quote unquote talk to your younger self or, or you know kind of future self in the sense that man i was just like the young kid in me was just like yeah, I, yeah. I, I, you know you, you don't know what to say but then the present uh professional is like hey how are you you know <laughs> exactly yeah well and you know they, they they drew random people to ask questions and and i had my question prepared but i knew if they called on me, I would freak out and just say something stupid like, hey, I'm going to name my dog De Niro. Wait a minute. Somebody <laughs> did that. <It's> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, Kevin, uh, we, are, we are here for the hot topic now. And the hot topic uh, for this week's show uh, relates to screenwriting. And so if there was a, a filmmaker, a screenwriter who could write your screenplay, who would it be and why about your life? So I'll let you dive in first and we'll go to Thomas and then we'll take mine. 
Yeah, so this first one that I have is more of an oddball. You'll see a connection with the rest that I, I have listed. But uh, first off, I would say Aaron Sorkin. So uh, there's something about his writing that is just, remember when I was talking about like you want to be engaged? Uh, his writing is so engaging. Um, the fact that, you know, with a film like The Social Network, I think the opening scene was like three pages worth of screenplay, but they condensed it down into one minute because they had to rapid fire, kind of go back and forth, back and forth. Uh, but it's so engaging. Um, you just, like, you have to be listening. Um, and so I, as my oddball, I definitely pick Sorkin because I, I just love to see what he does with my life, you know? <laughs> <laughs> awesome choice. And, and um, I'll, I'll move pretty quickly, Thomas, because Sorkin was my number one pick. And, nice. and the reason he was my number one pick is, is his command of dialogue is just so spectacular. And it's so real. It's so authentic. And I've always liked his work, you know, going back to his early TV days on Sports Night uh, and then, of course, on the West Wing. But, man, he's just incredible. So he's my first pick, too. So, Thomas, nice. Thomas, who's the first on your list? Uh, I'm going to go with uh, Ryan Johnson. Uh, he's been able to develop a name for himself for the, over the past 15 years, going back to 2005 with Brick, with uh, young Joseph Gordon-Levitt, <laughs> kind of a high school murder mystery whodunit. And then he's continued to – develop and he made you know of course First looper the years. futuristic time travel almost like a back to the future part two Too vibe strange. with gangsters back. have taken over the future and then of course the last jedi in 2017 oh. with his entry into the star wars universe and then even knives out last year yeah. got the best original screenplay yeah. nomination yeah. which was oh, kind of an oh. agatha christie whodunit throwback with saying. a modern twist on it and oh, just the quirky characters he's able to write and just crazy situations. And then you have, there's always somebody at the center of his stories that's kind of just a normal average Joe, like, <laughs> like Anna de Armas' character, um, who was uh, Marta Cabrera, I believe her name was. And she just kind of found herself in the middle of this crazy situation. And uh, I would love to see a story about my life that Ryan Johnson wrote and just put me in some of those situations. <laughs> Yeah, that's and a, you would, that's a good call. Yeah, and you would definitely not be the normal guy in the mix, right? Well, uh, you, you never know, yeah. I'll, I'll, let, I'll let a screenwriter make this. <laughs> good job. Yeah, yeah. Good yeah. choice, good yeah. choice. All right, Kevin, who else is on your list, man? Uh, all right, so this is where we're going to start kicking this off. I'm going to see if you guys can figure out the pattern. So Ryan Coogler uh, would definitely be number one. I, I think in terms of telling, um, as I'd like to say, black stories, like I just think he does a phenomenal job starting back with Fruitvale Station. I remember when I saw Fruitvale, um, we had just had my daughter at the time. So after, I just remember bawling. Like the story itself is, of course, uh, a tragedy. Um, but the way that he wrote uh, for, the, for, for that, the way that um, with all his films, whether it's Creed, uh, Black Panther, and I can't wait for Black Panther 2, there's something that he taps into that's just universal and human nature. And he's able to write it in such a way where um, it doesn't matter who you are, you can understand what that character yes. is going through. But yet he, he's one of those guys that does the research. He, he, he went to BART Station. I mean, he obviously was like lived in the area and all that stuff, but he does his research. Um, and then he puts all of that and his passion into the screenplays that he writes. So I, I, I definitely would go with Ryan Coogler. Good choice, man. Good choice. I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out where you're headed with, with all these, but uh, very good, very good choice uh, on a lot of different levels. Just a spectacular uh, screenwriter, absolutely. Thomas, who else is on your list, man? Uh, we'll go with the Coen brothers. Uh, that, was pro <laughs> that was probably on your list, Dad, but uh, they are known for uh, just telling stories that nobody else would have even thought of and creating such iconic characters and putting them in some of the most bizarre situations imaginable. And uh, I just love to see a story about my life or just a story that um, it doesn't even have to be any close to the tr anywhere close to the truth, but <laughs> just uh, to be written by the Coen brothers or just even to be a quirky side character that shows up for like five minutes, just put me in one of their movies. That would be 
that would be spectacular. And, and you know me very well, Thomas, because they yeah. were on my list as yeah. well. I mean, yeah. they, they're masters of quirky characters, as you mentioned, and their storylines and situations are just unbelievable. Um, and since, to, you know, the, the two of my choices are, are choices of you, of you guys, I'm going to throw out another one. Uh, Eric Roth uh, is a name that not a lot of people are familiar with, but they may be familiar with, with films like Forrest Gump. Uh, Curious Case of Benjamin Button, um, The Insider in Munich. What I love about Eric Roth is um, he understands adapting and adapting stories. He's a master of that. And so if you're going to have somebody write your life story, it is adapted from truth. So I'm really drawn to that. He also pays attention to, uh, to rich characters and the emotional impacts of relationships. And uh, I think a life story's should in some way reflect relationships. So uh, Eric Roth is is on my list. Um, like we that. Get, we've got time for at least one more. So uh, so Kevin, you want to dive in with another one? Oh man, can I just like spat spit off the rest of them? Right, go for it. Uh, go for it. <laughs> all right, Fra Frank Capra. Okay. Right? Uh, you talked about the um, a, a relationship and the emotions. Uh, that people have with your relationships. I think, um, you know, I, I've kind of settled on It's a Wonderful Life as one of my, as my, my all-time favorite film, um, mainly because I think, like, if you're going to talk about what life looks like and what it maybe should look like, it's just an amazing film. Um, so Frank Capra, Bong Joon-ho. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, you know, you go back to Snowpiercer, uh, Parasite. I just think that, like, he he's able to write again in such a way that we can understand it's this universal language uh, but at the same time it's just there, there's a little bit of quirk in there like he's just unique with his storytelling and then finally it's christopher nolan um yeah. <laughs> so uh i mean give him any genre and he excels in it much like ryan coogler too um, but like, you know, it's going to be unique, you know, it's going to be fresh. It's going to be an original tale and it's going to look amazing on the big screen. <laughs> yes. Yes, absolutely. Great choices. And, and, and I love how they all find ways to connect to certain aspects. Thomas, did you figure you, out, did you figure out what it is? I, I, I'm still thinking about what is it? Tell me. Oh, Thomas, do you know? Do you know the connections? Nah, I'm sorry, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> All, All right, right, so out of outside of Aaron Sorkin, it's writer director. So I, I kind of cheated ah. in the sense that they can write it and then they can shoot it. But you know, uh, with Molly's game, Sorkin is a writer and director, and he's also that working. Is true. Right now, he's working on his second film about the Chicago Eight, I believe. So yeah, so they're all writer directors. Very cool. Very nice. cool. Uh, Thomas, do you want to just run down your names? I've got one more on mine. Okay, yeah, I'll go with uh, Shane Black or Edgar Wright, either one of those. Uh, I think Shane Black would do a really good job just making me look cool uh, <laughs> and just making me look a lot more charismatic than I am in reality. And uh, I'd love to kind of have that, uh, that portrait on the big screen. Um, and then, of course, for Edgar Wright, he's a, a good friend of Ryan Johnson. And you look at some of the situations, some of their characters and their storylines, very similar and um, I would, you know, there's, I don't, it's kind of hard to differentiate between Ryan Johnson and Edgar Wright, but uh, I definitely those, those are some of my picks. Awesome. I'm going to throw one more out there. Uh, and this also re relates to life, understanding family and friends and uh, living the adventures that life throws your way, even when they're odd and freaky. Um, John Hughes, even though he's not mm -hmm. around he just had a way of capturing life once again and, yeah. uh, and doing it through some characters that felt real, felt like there were people that you knew uh, or people that you wanted to know. So, uh, so there you go. Thanks for playing along. This has been fun. Uh, the hot topic this week, uh, if our, our lives were screenplays, who would write it? Uh, Kevin Sampson, appreciate you being our guest. Uh, Kevin, how can people find you if they wanted to find out more about you and your work and, 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 and what you're doing? Yeah, PictureLockShow.com. Uh, everything is at PictureLockShow, uh, DCBFF.org for a DC Black Film Festival. Thanks so much for having me on, guys. This was awesome. Awesome. And uh, Thomas Manning, you can always find his work, uh, ElementsOfMadness.com. And uh, Thomas, also, where, what is your uh, YouTube channel and your, uh, uh, give us some information, Thomas, where people can find you. All right, you can find me, uh, the rundown on movies.com, where my uh, written review is on my blog and on YouTube. It is uh, Thomas Manning's Rundown on Movies. Uh, I do leave you with a quote of the week always, and uh, this one kind of ties in. Uh, this comes from uh, Columbus, from Zombieland Double Tap. You know, life is more than just survival. 
we are a family. Dysfunctional, sure, yeah. What family is it? So uh, until next time, I'm Noel T. Manning II for Kevin and for Thomas. For Meet Me the Movies, this week, that's a wrap.